Well, it is my privilege, as always, to get to share with you guys today. We, um, uh, if we have not had the chance to meet, my name is Nate. I'm one of the pastors here at Upward, and uh, every now and then I get the chance to teach a little bit, and this is one of those mornings. Uh, so glad to be with you. Pastor Andy will be back next week, uh, but pray for him. They are actually going to be doing some traveling this coming week. Uh, bringing their son Michael back this way from an internship he's been at uh, for this summer and then heading back to school. So pray for them as they travel. But today we get to hang out, right? All right, good deal. So we are continuing this look at uh, really what is an autobiographical book, okay? Jonah wrote this book that we're reading from about himself. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't know if this is the case. There are different authors and different teachers and scholars who think all different things. But to some degree, I have to wonder if maybe he wrote it so that we would learn this concept of don't be that guy. Because there's not a whole lot redemptive about his story personally, if that makes sense. There's a lot going on in there. So, so today we're going to continue to learn from Jonah, this guy who just didn't want to, okay? So to get us going, I got a question for you. How many of you have ever had one of those days where you roll out of bed and it's just, bleh. Does that describe it well? Was that accurate? I feel like some of you resonated with that. Bleh. You know, you wake up. And like before you're even fully, you know that weird spot where your alarm's gone off like 27 times and you're like kind of awake but still kind of asleep and you know what this day's going to hold. And you're already thinking to yourself, Bleh. you just, you just don't want to. Maybe it's somebody that you know you've got to deal with, you know what I'm talking about? No offense if this is your name, but maybe it's like Brad. You know, you got to deal with Brad. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about. You got to deal, or maybe it's Deb at the office. Everybody loves Deb. And you know that you've got a meeting today with one of them, and you just don't want to. Maybe it's work, or it's school, or maybe your parents told you that you have to clean your room. You just don't want to. That's Jonah. That's Jonah's attitude throughout this entire book. He had this assignment. This responsibility that was given to him by God that he was supposed to carry out, and he just didn't want to do it. And I can relate to this guy. You know, there are sometimes throughout Scripture you read about someone, and you're like, wow, like this, this great faith, and you know, I just can't believe, you know, we read stories about Moses, and, and we read about like Abraham, and, and some of these people who did these amazing things for God and, and trusted God, and we're just like, I can never be that. Man, I read Jonah, and I'm like, I can be that guy. Don't want to be that guy, but I can be that guy. So here's the thing. We want to give you a little background. We want to cover a little bit of what we did last week to get you up to date and carry you a little bit further in the story, if that's okay. So what we've got, we've got a guy named Jonah. God came to him and said, I've got a message for you that I want you to take to these people, the Ninevites. And Jonah says, uh-uh, no way, I'm not doing it. No, not going to do it. So he refuses to obey God's word. That's what we looked at last week. He turns around, goes the complete opposite direction, and hops on a boat. Okay? Because that's what you do when you don't want to do. You get on a boat, right? That's why there are some people not here today. They didn't want to go to church. They got on a boat. Bless them. Hallelujah. All right? So it happens. He gets on this boat, and all of a sudden a storm kicks up. A really nasty storm, a storm so bad that even the people who make their living on the sea get scared. That's a bad storm. When people who make their living there get scared, storm kicks up and they realize, oh, it's your fault. It's you. It's the God that you serve. That's why we're in this mess. And so as a result, Jonah says, just whatever, throw me over the boat. And so they do. And they toss him over. And he ends up getting eaten for dinner by a fish that clearly doesn't know how to chew well. I don't get it. I don't understand it. Whatever. He ends up in the belly of this big old fish. And in the belly of the fish, 
he flips his wig, and he's like, God, just get me out of here. I'm so sorry. I'll make it right. Just please, whatever you do, it smells so bad. Just get me out of here. And so, as a result, God gives the fish acid reflux, and bleh, there it is. Just like that, okay? Out of the belly of the fish, God says again, Jonah, I gave you a message. Go do it. I want you to go say what I asked you to say. And Jonah does that typical 15-year-old thing. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> he walks off. Some people can relate. Say amen. amen. Jonah walks off and he gives the message. And when he delivers a half-hearted, barely even a sentence-long message to the people of Nineveh, they repent. They recognize they're wrong and they repent. And we read in chapter 3, verse 10, when God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop in their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. That's awesome. That's awesome. And we know on, 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 this, on this side of the cross of Jesus, we know where we stand today. We have an understanding that God did this because of who he is. He is love. He is compassion. Even to the worst of us, he is love. And so God's message that he sent through his messenger Jonah was always motivated by love. Hear me, folks. The end goal was never their destruction. It was always repentance. He sent the message out of a heart of love. So let's head to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1, and we're going to read just a little bit together. It says, This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. And listen, this is what I want, to, want us to focus on. Even Jonah knew that God was a God of love. Didn't I say before we left home that you would do this? It's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew you are a what? Merciful and compassionate God. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. There it is. See, God sent a message out of love, but Jonah never felt the same way. And we're going to see this today as we walk through this. But jo there was no love lost between Jonah and the Ninevites. Listen, let's be honest. He hated them. This wasn't a, I don't like them. You know, there are some people in life you just don't like. It's not where Jonah was. He hated their guts. He wanted nothing to do with these people. And yet God sends this message of love. So today what we're going to do is we're going to unpack what does it look like when I just don't want to love God's world. Okay? You had all the opportunity to laugh on the front side of this. From here forward, it just gets super awkward. And I'd love it if two security could come stand right here. No, I'm just kidding. Listen, <clears throat> this is one of those messages that uh, I'll be honest with you, my wife can nod as I, I admit this. I felt like Jonah about this message. I was like, oh, no. No, 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 no. I, it started with Pastor Andy. He was like, this is what you're going to share. I'm like, no, I'm not. No, <laughs> He said, do you like your job? No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said, I, I want you to share this. I think you can do a great job with it. I said, okay. And God and I went back and forth. This is what you need to understand as we walk through today's message. It offends me. Okay? So can we all just agree to be offended together, but to receive truth? Okay? So after the service is over, I don't need you coming up to me and be like, Pastor Nate, I just don't understand what's wrong with you. You've gone soft. That's what, no, 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 just stand down. Stand down. It ticks me off too. Okay? So let's be ticked off together. Is that fair? So here's the thing. What does it look like when I don't want to love God's world? The first thing that we need to catch from the life of Jonah is that when I don't want to go love God's world, I'm fueled by anger. That's the fire that gets me going. Anger. Just being ugh, all the time at everything around me. I'm fueled by anger. Look again at what happened 
in verse 1. This change of plans. Now, to be clear, it was never a change of plans. This was always the plan. I want to reiterate that. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became what, church? Very angry. He started using his out-of-church words. He was so upset. He was mad. He was frustrated. He was ticked off. Now, confession, I grew up in a home with both uh, an older brother and a younger sister. And I can tell you, as I'm sure would they, uh, that there was always this measure of sick joy that came into any of us when mom or dad would say those treasured words, go tell your brother I need to see him now. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) I'll do it. Right? Y'all with me? Any siblings in the house that are like, yes, there was, it was just as soon as my dad would say to me, I need you to go tell Josh, I need to see him right now. I'm like, well, I'd be happy to, Papa. <laughs> Whoo, gone. I will take that message with enthusiasm. And see, here's the thing. This is, this is what was great. Is when you went and you gave that message, hey, Josh. Hey, Miriam. Mom and dad want to see you now. That's how they said it too. Now. <laughs> and they <laughs> I know, I get it. I'm twisted. Y'all just pray for me. <laughs> they would go and they would start a conversation. And what did you do? What did I do? <laughs> you know why? Because there was a part of us that was just waiting for the shoe to drop, boy. We were like, this is good. You are busted. It's going to be so good. We were excited because they're just going to get drilled. And I'll tell you what was the most disgusting thing in the world. Just bleh, made you want to barf. Is when you said, go. They want to see you now. And then you listened in. And it was one of those, listen, we love you. We don't want you to make this mistake. What? We love you? <laughs> Can anybody relate? Am I the only twisted weirdo in the room? I am. Okay. Somebody said, yeah. (laughs) Here's the thing. We laugh. We laugh at that attitude. But here's the thing. That's the exact attitude Jonah had towards the Ninevites. Fueled by anger. Fueled by you are going to get it. But listen, to understand his response and where he was coming from, what was going on inside of him, we do need a little bit of background, okay? Nineveh was not just some random evil city. All right? Random wasn't, uh, or Nineveh wasn't just one of those cities that God was like, man, they're really messed up and I need to pronounce judgment so they'll repent, all of that. Nineveh was actually the capital of Assyria. If you know not just church history, but if you know like world history, you want to talk about sick and twisted. That was Assyria. These were some bad people. Okay? Now, historically, Assyria was an empire that made repeated war campaigns against the nation of Israel, against the northern tribes, took them over, wiped out many of the southern cities and the tribe of Judah, the nation of Judah, that portion over and over. They killed entire populations of cities, took hundreds of thousands into captivity. And this was all things that were happening around the time of the writing of Jonah. Are y'all with me? I'll slow down if you need me to. Do I need to slow down? Okay. Bad, horrible people. Listen, let's just sum it up this way, okay? They were terrorists. That's what they were. They were terrorists. So Jonah's primary source of anger and frustration was that God was showing compassion, love, and mercy to a country that Jonah saw as an enemy of his own. He didn't want these people to be spared. But God was abounding in love. So Jonah got stuck. He was stuck in this place 
of recognizing who God was, but looking at this people and saying they don't deserve love. Jonah, hear me. Let's just all lean in for a second. This is where it gets a little more teach and you're, I love you. <laughs> um, Jonah had become so politically and emotionally aligned with national security interests of his people, Israel, that he lacked compassion for anyone not of his tribe. This is where it gets weird, I know, because we're like pushing up. Can we all just admit we're pushing up against the line in our country right now? Is that okay? Can I go there? I love you. That's where you're supposed to say you love me, but you didn't. Anyway. Here's the thing, not necessarily intentionally, but unfortunately it is the same for many of us in this room today. We claim Christianity, but our religion is Republican. Here, I'll be an equal opportunity offender. We claim to love Christ, but our devotion is Democrat. That one got more amens. That was interesting. Yeah, yeah, there we go. We claim to be citizens of heaven, but our greater allegiance is to the good old U.S. of A. And that's the challenge. We, as Christ followers, cannot allow Christianity to become the vehicle for our angry political agendas. I, listen, it offends me. I get it. I know. It means some of you are going to have to go home and clean up your Facebook page. That's your action step for the day. <laughs> I'm glad y'all are laughing. <laughs> okay. Let's keep going. Uh, here's, here's the thing. We, we can't claim to be Christians, Christ followers, little Christs. If our social media pages are filled with quote-unquote truth, void of compassion and love for human beings. We can't do that. Now, am I saying let's swing political persuasions? No, that's just it. I'm saying throw your political persuasions out the window and just love people the way Christ did. Can I keep going? Okay. Y'all are great. I love y'all. This is good. This is good. We're healing. Hey, hey, hey. All right. Here we go. Listen, here's the thing. Um, every person with brown skin of Middle Eastern descent is not a radical terrorist. I, listen, I know. I get it. Push a little further. Every person trying to to cross our southern border is not someone intent on breaking our laws, stealing our jobs, and swaying votes. Okay? That's where Jonah got stuck. That's where the church many times gets stuck. We, we get so focused in on this is who I am. My nationality is who I am. No, friends. Christ is who I am. This nation is where I'm blessed to live. But Christ is who I am. To be fair, some people are radical terrorists. And some people are seeking to do those things. Now, don't, don't, don't go amen in because that fits more into your political viewpoint. I'm just, I just want to be fair. Some people are godless miserable, evil people. But God still loves them. And we have to choose whether we, like Jonah, will be fueled by anger and blinded by our earthly allegiances or filled with love. As long as it is us versus them, as long as it's my tribe is better than your tribe, my people are better than your people, we will never become the full expressions of love 
that Christ has called us to become. So, when I don't want to love God's world, I'm fueled by anger. Not only that, number two, I'm filled with arrogance. Yeah, it gets progressively worse, sorry. Um, But it gets better at the end. Uh, So, check out verse two. This blows my mind. This change of plans had greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. But listen to this. So he complained to the Lord about it. I mean, here's a good thing. Here's the thing Jonah did right. At least if you're going to complain, complain to someone that can actually do something about it. That's a word for the church today. Stop complaining to the person sitting next to you. Start complaining to the one who can do something about it. Okay? So he complained to the Lord, but this is where it gets really great. I love this. Didn't I say, listen to the tone. See, sometimes you can't read it, but this was Jonah's tone. Trust me, I know. Because I've done it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this? That's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew. that. Here's how it really went. I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and unfailing in love. You don't want to destroy anybody, God. That's how Jonah said it. Like, no, he didn't. Yeah, he did. Anytime you start a sentence with, I told you so, God, I can promise you that's where the tone is. He's filled with all of this arrogance. We can relate to this, I think, because here's the thing. God spares the people of Nineveh, and Jonah puffs up and says, I knew you would screw this up. (laughs) You know people in your life that are like that? Yeah. Me too. Um, he just says, I knew you would mess this whole, uh, whole thing up. And here's what's crazy. He even justifies his actions. Did you catch what he said? He said, I knew you would do this. We had this conversation before I left home. Not recorded in the first part of the book. So clearly there was a long conversation where Jonah was like, God, I'm not going. God said, yes, you are going to go. And Jonah said, I'm not going to go because all you're going to do is love him and be merciful. And, be, and God said, shut your mouth, go. And then he ran the other way. But notice what he says, that is why I ran away. It was as though in this moment, in his arrogance, Jonah was saying, God, I had to run away in order to ensure that you wouldn't screw up what really needed to happen to these people. Because if I had just gone, this would have happened, and it has happened. But I had to run. I had to do this. He even, catch this, starts quoting scripture back to God. Yeah. You can go ahead and try that one. You let me know. Smite me, almighty smiter. Yeah, you will get hit by a lightning bolt if you're not careful. He comes back at God and he says, I knew you were merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry, filled with unfailing love. Those are the words of Moses. Go look it up, Exodus chapter 34. That's how Moses describes God in a good way. Jonah is now describing God that way, saying, I can't believe you would mess this up. And this arrogance, this arrogance is even on display in his prayer life. It does the same in our own prayer life. Let me just highlight something for you. If you go back to chapter 2, as as Jonah is in the belly of this fish, he says this, Um, here's a good one. Oh, Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more toward your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. Hallelujah. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Great prayer. As long as he was praying it for himself. There was an arrogance to what Jonah thought, the way he behaved. He was fine praying for salvation for himself, but when it came to seeing that same love extended to tens of thousands of people, he looked at them and he said, well, yeah, I deserve it. But them? posture of arrogance well yeah yeah of course i get it god God, i'm better than them 
I remember um, attending a conference uh, several years back with our pastor. We were both there. Um, actually, I think it was one where several of our staff uh, went along with us. But there was, um, there was a well-known ministry leader, evangelist, well-known. Uh, I, won't, I won't say who. But he spoke with just fervor and passion and excitement as he was on a platform in front of thousands at this conference. Loves the Lord. Hear me. Loves the Lord. Ha- has, has made an impact on countless people's lives through the ministries he's a part of. Thank God. But in this moment, this individual stood on the platform and began to declare, and everybody was excited. And, and then there was this moment where he said, what we need to do is we need to stand firm. We need to go to our state houses and our capital steps, and we need to make sure that the gays don't win no matter what what the cost. And Pastor and I were sitting right next to each other and we both looked at each other in the same moment because we were sickened by what we just heard. Now this is where it's tough. Here's that line again. Because some of you are like, amen. Here's the problem. We better than them. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're hateful and bitter and angry. How about instead of saying we need to make sure that they don't win no matter the cost, how about instead we say we need to show them the love of Christ and how they can know him and be redeemed by his love and compassion no matter the cost. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on, because there's a tear. I'm just going to say it. There's a tear in the room right now. I'm just going to call it what it is. Is that okay if I kind of operate on a different level? There's a split in the room because some of you are like, yes, amen. I feel that. Some of you are like, I don't like what he's saying anymore. I'm done listening to him. That's okay. I respect where you're coming from, and I still love you enough to say this truth in love. Stop. It's not about proving people wrong. It's about proving Christ is Lord. That's what our heart should be. That's what our desire should be. Listen, this is the point, okay? When I see someone who is broken, when I see someone who is hurting, when I see someone who is looking for direction, when I see someone who is far from God, my first response should be to meet the need. My first response should be in some way to ask, what can I do to offer assistance? My first response should be love. Not to determine whether or not they're gay, straight, legal, undocumented, or of a certain political persuasion. Now that's hard. That's the hard truth right there. And I know, because listen, it's not just that I'm feeling resistance. I too find myself pushing that, managing that tension constantly. Because we still have to speak truth, okay? We don't back down from truth. But we can't rush to truth without love accompanying it. Because one without the other is not either. Truth without love is not truth. Love without truth is not love. To do so is arrogant when we behave that way. It's to send a message that only certain people deserve the love of God. Jonah takes it a step further. And he says this. He says what he says in chapter 4, the end of verse 2 and 3, demonstrating not only that he was fueled by anger, and that he was filled with arrogance, but that he was fixed on destruction. Listen to this. He says to God, I know that you are eager to turn back from destroying people. Amen? 
I'm thankful that I serve a God who's eager to turn back from destroying people because otherwise I would have been gone a long time ago. He says, you serve a God. He says, I serve a God and I know who you are. You're eager to turn back from destroying people, still in his condescending, arrogant tone. And then he says in verse 3, listen to this. Just kill me now. He says, just kill me. He says, I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted happens. No hidden messages there. Jonah just says, burn it down. Burn it all to the ground. See, you would would think that there would have been some measure of rejoicing in, in his own statement. You're eager to turn back from destroying people? Like people who run from what you ask them to do? Like people who hide in the bottom of a boat when God's asking them to do? Like people who end up in the belly of a fish? You would think that there would be this light that goes off in Jonah's head that was like, praise God, you are eager to turn back from destroying idiots just like me. But no, he's like, here we go. Just kill me. Jonah is in full on burn it all and let the bodies hit the flow mode. That's where he is. Let's just boom, wipe them all out. I'm done with all of them, and if you're not going to kill them, then just kill me. He was completely displeased that God just didn't wipe them from their face. Here's the thing. If God had just sent fire and lightning bolts and blown the whole thing up, Jonah would have gone home with a smile on his face. We really showed them, didn't we, Lord? That's what he would have done. He would have been thrilled if God just blew it all up. We really showed those Ninevites, God. Hallelujah. We really showed those liberals, Lord. (laughs) Right? He was fixed on destruction. (laughs) My two youngest have learned how to play Monopoly this summer. And it's terrifying. It really is. You remember the story I told at the front side about how sick and twisted I am? It apparently heads right to the next generation. Um, They they will play. Listen, they've learned how to deal and how to negotiate and all of this stuff. And here's what's really crazy. I played with them last night. I am scared. (laughs) Because if what they did in that game translates into their lives as leaders and business people, mm, bless you. Uh, we played, uh, my, my son was upstairs playing drums, and so the four of us played a, a round of Monopoly. And I kid you not, there was something strange that transpired as one of my children, I'm not going to name names, um, as one of my children rolled the dice and hit a seven. And as another one of my children, I won't name names, but she has curly hair and she's beautiful and has blue eyes. Another of my children, as the seven was rolled, now realized that that the other child was going to land on their property. And it was this. (laughs) No, 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 no. Hold on. See, y'all think I'm being dramatic, Nate, and like overdoing this thing. That's literally what she did. She actually went... (laughs) Then she looks at him and says, I'm going to wipe you out. (laughs) Didn't quite wipe him out. Later in the game, I heard this phrase out of the other one. You just wait. I will break you. (laughs) True? She's laughing up here. It's terrifyingly true. This is what took place in my living room. See, there was this, there was this, <laughs> and again, we laugh, but there was this fixation on the fall of another. There was a rejoicing in the fall of another. And listen to me, folks, so many times, just like Jonah, that's the trap we fall into. 
We become fixated on someone else's demise. Jonah so much so that he actually said, I would rather perish than see them saved. We have got to get that message out of the church. Enough. Stop. See, y'all love the fun, happy Nate. Sometimes you get that, mmm, like right on the line here. Stop. Jonah missed the message. Here's what's interesting. You realize God said to another prophet by the name of Ezekiel, he said these words, do I take pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God? Certainly not. He doesn't rejoice in any of that. He says, if they change their ways, they'll live. What if, instead of fueled by the anger and filled with the arrogance, what if, instead of fixated on the destruction of others, what if we embraced this mindset? Let me read some words to you. They'll be on the screen from a pastor that you may be familiar with, maybe not, either way. His name was Charles Spurgeon, and he said this. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish. Get this visual with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. If we got that as the church, if we stopped with our condescending messages and we stopped with our judgmental racial prejudices, if we stopped with our political focuses and fixations and we just became a church that didn't want people to go to hell, what would happen, church? What? No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. Listen, listen, hear me, hear me. What if instead of just getting here on Sunday and hearing a good message, we actually wanted people to know Jesus? What would happen? How amazing would it be to be that church? Amen? So what do we do? So what is it that we do? The first thing I want to tell you is this. I'm going to read it to you. It'll be up there on the screen. It'll be in your notes. The first thing we do is remember this. Romans 5, 8 and 10. But God showed his great love for us. Listen, church. By sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. If we can remember that, if we can be inspired by that every day when we wake up, the only reason I'm here is because when I was still an enemy of God, he sent his son as the perfect expression of his love for me, even when I was his enemy. Remember that. And two, Practice this. 1 Corinthians 13. And no, it's not just for weddings. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would be nothing but a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. You can memorize as much of this as you want. You can be able to teach it, parse it, exegete, exposit, every bit that you want. You, you can get every single little bit right. But if you don't love, you're just noise. Your social media page is just noise. Blah, 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 blah. Boom. That's all it is. 
Love is patient and kind, not jealous or boastful, arrogant, or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. I learned this when I was very young. I had a Sunday school teacher when I was a kid that actually read this passage to us and said, everywhere you see the word love and it, replace it with your name. Nate is patient and kind, not jealous, boastful, or proud or rude. Nate does not demand his own way. Nate is not irritable. He keeps no record of being wrong. Nate does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when truth wins out. Nate never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful. Love. Love them. Call on God to empower you today to become an expression of his love to the world. But Nate, you don't understand that. No, 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 no. There is no they did. There is no they said. There is no but they are. But Nate, they're just so evil. Wait, wait, wait. Go all the way back to our history. The Ninevites. That's evil. God still loved. So this is your action step this week. You ready? Your action step is this. Number one, love someone who is different than you this week. Share a meal with them. Talk. Talk about your differences. You don't have to agree with them. You can even say, I believe that you're wrong. I believe that the God that I worship says this. You can disagree, but still do it in love. Share a meal with them. Meet a need in their life. Serve them. Your first action step this week, love someone who is different than you are. Second action step, you ready? Love someone who is different than you are. Some of you got it. Share a meal with them. Meet a need. Give. Last action step. Anybody want to take a guess? Love someone different than you. That's God's heart. That's God's heart for every one of us in this room. And that's what he wants us to show others. I want to ask you just for a moment, bow your head, close your eyes. Because I believe this with all my heart. Someone in this room today, I believe this 100%. You have been exposed repeatedly to the church that's all about the condemnation, the judgment, the hardship, the hard edge of God. And trust me, there is a God who is looking down, and he, he does judge our sins. He does recognize in every one of us the wrongdoing. But what I want to tell you this morning is this. God loved you so much that he was willing to lay it all on the line, giving of his own life that he could have relationship with you. If you're here in this room today, and you've never started a relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never prayed a prayer that, that, that admitted, God, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, and I'm messed up, and I know the only way I can be saved is trusting and believing in you. If you're here today, you've never prayed that prayer, but today you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. The one who loves you with an eternal love. Will you right now just be bold enough to just raise your hand? high in the air, right beside your head. If that's you today, make sure I see you. Just kind of wave at me if you need to. Anyone who would say, I want to begin a relationship with Christ today. Amen. And for the rest of us, the prayer is simple. God, empower us to love. Empower us to love. In Jesus' name. Amen.